<laughs> yeah, we're all laughing. Here we are once again. Welcome to Everyone's a Critic. Uh, and uh, we're back. This is for WonderCon at home. Uh, happening again, 2021. Just found out we'll be probably doing this again for San Diego as well in a couple of months. And we all haven't gotten together since last San Diego. We were back there in July doing San Diego at home and going, well, this will only last a couple more months, right? And here we are keeping on going. And so uh, everybody, welcome everybody. Tom, Bob, Alan, let's intro uh, what outlets you're writing for right now and where people can find you online. Bob. Uh, you can find me at uh, moviebobcentral.com and the Movie Bob YouTube channel. I uh, generally try to share my stuff around through my uh, YouTube handle at, uh, at the underscore Movie Bob. And uh, that's what I do. I'm a freelancer uh, on that uh, and uh, freelance uh, part-time writer for uh, Film Theory uh, channel on YouTube as well that uh, just started recently. Awesome. Tom. I am a professor of communication and media studies at Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach, Florida. And uh, right now <laughs> I don't have a podcast. Well, actually that's, that's not true. I am a frequent guest on TV Campfire podcast, which is carried on a variety of outlets, but iTunes, you can search for it there. And uh, I also have a book, um, Cameron Frequencies Open Communication on Star Trek The Next Generation. Cool. Alan. I'm the, Alan, I'm managing editor at Film Thread. I write a whole mess of reviews there. And uh, yeah, we, we mostly focus on independent films. Awesome. Uh, I'm Bill Waters. You can find me mostly on NerdBot these days. Sometimes you can find me on Screen Ramp and, and a few other outlets, but mostly on NerdBot. So let's get talking about, so... How's it been different? I mean, all the festivals moving over to a virtual environment, some ways it's uh, better, sometimes it's worse. This is my first time at Sundance this year doing the virtual version. Um, you gentlemen, have any of you done like Sundance before? Yeah, I did I did Sundance this year. I, I went last year in person, which was, I uh, can't believe it was a year ago. But uh, yeah, I've done the major ones, uh, even Slam Dance, and then we're doing South by Southwest as well. Awesome. The, so did you find, how did you find the virtual version versus the in-person version? Uh, it is nothing like the in-person in version. Um, you know, I, this is a bandwagon. I'm going to put my stakes in here. Um, I, I want to go back. Uh, but in terms of actually seeing movies, it's, it's not, watching it at home on your TV or your iPad is not the best environment. And even even their attempt at a at a virtual kind of uh, hangout, virtual bar, it's just it's just not the same. I saw a great movie called Taming the Garden. It looks beautiful, but it looks horrible on my television. Yeah, um, it's just uh, I I know they're trying, but you know there's nothing like a a nice large screen with a great sound system. Also, Dana, did you do Sundance this year? I did do Sundance this year. So, hi, so hi everyone. Howdy. Hi, Actually, let's go in because we just did intros a second ago. Dana, where people find you? Uh, you can find me as the DHK, which my screen name now says, on the internet, which is where we all reside <laughs> now. <laughs> How did you like Sundance virtual versus real? Um, I was exhausted. I thought I had hit my human limits when I went to Sundance in person and you see like 20 movies in a day and you're like, what's up and what's down, what's happening anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then seeing 20 movies in a day from the comfort of my home is actually even more mania inducing, I think. Yeah, no, I think I had similar, cause like this is my first time doing Sundance, doing it virtually. And I'm like, this is great. And I could, I found it easier because I've always heard the stories about trying to get from theater to theater and make it in time for the lines or what you had. But since it's all here, you can see them all. But by the time that you're done and you keep jumping around and catching, you know, doing the catch ups, it's like, all right, I, like Dana said, I've seen 20 movies today. I can't really see straight. And especially a lot of those indie films, uh, on, especially on the sci fi bent, they started blurring together after a while and so many of them had like this odd red tint to them like the the strawberry mansion fields movie whatever it was and then something else had a whole bunch of pink and i'm like no more movies with pink in it just done <laughs> yeah i i uh i didn't get to go uh to just with my the schedule that i had set up for uh for work in general and a few other things that were going on uh, here at the homestead i uh, didn't really get to uh to do the full-on festival I'm, uh, I appreciate that they still did it. I kind of feel like if they're going to do the, the virtual film festival thing, I feel like they should either do the, either 
host a festival or just post everything online. Because this thing where like, okay, well, we're doing, we're, we're going to put everything online, but we're still going to schedule it like a festival. So you still have to be there at like, you know, be in front of your computer at like 10 or, or two to watch this thing. And then it goes away again. Well, the second viewing windows though, were pretty generous. Those like were there were, great. yeah, those, I was, those, those I, those I didn't feel nice. obligated yeah. to show up at the actual times. Yeah. It, yeah. It was better. It was better. It's um, it's better than a few others that I've seen that have tried to like keep the adherence there. I, I will so say that the that. one thing I liked about it was they at least attempted to do a live Q and a, mm. um, it took me three days to figure out how to get to it, but <laughs> at least they attempted to do it. I never figured that out. I just went, yeah. I'll watch it on YouTube tomorrow, <laughs> which was fine. Yeah. And I well, think yeah. it was a, you know, there's the uh, there's the pros of being able to just get around and seeing what you need to, but the cons, like you said, there's something about being there, seeing some of these films in a, in a, the collaborative audience environment that kind of helps sink in some of some of these things because there's some films watching was it Prisoners of Ghostland, the the, the, mm. Nick, the Cage Nick Cage film. classic, the amazing <laughs> oh, Nick Cage God. classic. Well, you know, number one, I was like watching it, and I'm like, like he needs another cult film, but I have to imagine that watching that in a theater with the crowd would have been the most batshit crazy kind of experience. Um, just because it's just so off the, off the hook. Um, let's talk about just, you know, everyone's a critic these days. And, you know, what do we think is going to happen next as, as it evolves to the HBO Max, what they're doing with things and going back towards theaters? Uh, before we had started the panel tonight, uh, Tom brought up Tom and Jerry just did 16 million and change last weekend. Um, it's kind of surreal. Um, what do we think is going to happen over the next couple of months as it applies to theaters? Are people going to go back in droves? It sounds like people are going to back to see whatever's there. I'm in an interesting position because theaters have been open in Florida or reopened in Florida since fall, since September. So I saw Tenet on the big screen. <laughs> and that, that was the first thing I reactivated my A-list account for Tenet. There was a decent size crowd in the theater, but the AMC, I think, caps at 40%. It still wasn't 40% full. Right. And more recently, you know, I saw one WW84 opening day. <laughs> That's two and a half hours I'm not getting back. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, and again, it, it was Christmas Day on one hand, and it was a big tin pole on another, but the theater wasn't still that close to being at capacity, even with reduced capacity. More recently, I loved land when I, I got a, uh, I had access to a guild screener of land and thankfully it was through Apple TV so I can see it on my 65 inch versus my iPad or iPhone or computer. Blah. But I saw land in the theater when it opened for real. There were, it was a theater that seated probably 150 plus. If there were 10 people in the whole theater, I'd be surprised. Got which it. is and now granted it's an indie film i love that film by the way I, I thought robin wright just nailed it and i don't know if any of you have seen it but that's my favorite film of last year or <laughs> that should have been from last year but it's kind of depressing i've been talking with my students about it i don't know if crowds will go back to theaters like they did before especially with capacity capped probably still for a while mm -hmm. and with people used to watching stuff at home paramount plus officially uh, launches slash rebrand CBS All Access on Thursday. And they're gonna put all their theatrical hits releases on Paramount Plus 45 days after release. That includes Mission, Im or sorry, um, Top Gun 2, wrong Tom Cruise movie, and A Quiet Place 2, and whatever other you know things they've got coming out. So I don't know. I I think it's going to be dicey. Plus, AMC's in debt up to the yin yang. Even though they managed to get their, give their CEO a fat bonus, that's some serious BS. Mm. Don't worry, Reddit's going to save AMC. So <laughs> fine. Yeah, their stock price. Is Ga yeah, GameStop, y'all. Like we we this is an investing <laughs> panel now, and uh, <laughs> some tips for you. <laughs> hey man, Reddit can totally save stocks and businesses for at least seventy two hours. <laughs> Yeah, you know, after that, it's a little bit more questionable. Uh, any other thoughts about the theaters? I yeah, mean, you know, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, you know, thinking about the last now almost 365 days and 
the upcoming slates, there is no movie in this world I could think of that would get me to go back to a theater until I'm vaccinated and until I am comfortably, you know, confident that the majority of people around me are vaccinated. Like, it's just no movie is worth that to me. And as much as I love the theater experience, as much as I love the terrible popcorn and the giant soda, and, you know, being able to talk with my friends right after, I think that's the thing I miss the most, right? That debrief after you get out of the theater and you all kind of like chitter to each other, like, what did you think? What did you think? Did you see that moment? Um, there's nothing, there's nothing that's worth it to me because my health is, you know, more important and everyone else's health is more important than cinema. And I, I do appreciate the artists who came forward in the last year and put their work out there and kept us entertained and like slightly sane, but just thinking about it, I'm not going back for six months, eight months, possibly a year. And I hate, I hate that, but it's just, there's nothing, there's nothing worth it to me. Yeah. I yeah. got my second shot on the 12th and uh, me and my brother who will also have a second shot by then will be in the theater for uh, King Kong versus Godzilla. Uh, sorry, Godzilla versus Kong. My apologies to Warner Brothers for using the non-copyright friendly <laughs> title. And uh, we will be watching that come hell or high water. And if anyone wearing anything not close to a mask gets near me, I'm just going to break their face. And uh, that's going to be all there is to it because I'm safe now and they can get the hell out of my way. There you go. Alan. And, that, and that's just what there is to it. I've been inside for a year. I followed all the rules. I uh, did exactly what I was supposed to do. I've been a good boy, and I'm taking my reward. I'm going back to the movies. <laughs> Alan. Yeah, my, my experience is similar to Thomas's. Uh, we, we opened up in Orange County for, you know, throughout most of the summer. And, um, you know, I, I was never in a theater that had more than five people in it. And uh, and I feel like it's gonna be the same way for a while here that when, when they reopen and it feels like it's gonna happen in, in, in a few weeks, um, I, I you know I don't think people are gonna come anyways. So why not why not take advantage of a big empty theater and see a big giant movie? And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, it's gotta happen, I, I need to get out of this house. I don't know if you folks had the same experience over the last year, but I had various times where it was hard to get screeners because studios mm -hmm. didn't want to release screeners unless the movie was showing in your area. And if you were in an area that was in heavy lockdown, they're like, oops, but guess what? The critics over in, you know, wherever it is that is open in, you know, in Dallas, they could go see the movie. So they would, you know, they would get the screeners. And so it got better over the, over the course of the year. Or did you guys have, were fine with all your reps and you got all the movies just fine? It was just me. I think the issue was, I think the release dates were so uncertain that they weren't yeah. releasing. We got we got screeners and stuff that didn't that never opened, and uh, and so that was all in flux. I think now there's a little more stability to the schedule, and plus it's going all online. I mean, I'm getting Warner Brothers stuff like crazy right now. Yeah, I'm gonna plead the fifth because I still have to do business with my uh, reps when uh, stuff eventually gets back. <laughs> something like normal so i'm not gonna say what i think about uh, the yeah. publicist industry or anyone working for the studios well i totally give you know it, it's at, at least for my reps i give them full credit in that you know it's not their fault what the studio says here you can ship these out versus not and they're always real can about this is what i've got and these are my options and and you know they're pretty good folks and they they do their best with what they've got but to alan's point this last year yeah, we had some screenings on the books that they, you know, two days later, they're like, no, nope, that screening just been pushed. We're not doing it. We're dropping this one. And then three months later, they try it again and do the same thing again. So it's been an interesting challenge trying to find things to, to write about when you're really hurting for new, you know, new content. I mean, most of the big, you know, films coming up this year in theory are all things that we were writing about two years ago and then last year getting ready to release it and you know dune will eventually release really promise at some point and you know it just makes for kind of that that ongoing thing how's everyone's you know the experience in writing for your respective outlets and stuff has that changed at all about what sort of content you have to go after are you doing more streaming stuff than you did before just for kind of backfill or what I mean, I'm I'm happy to do the streaming stuff. I think the the issue for me is not having to do with screeners. It's just like I might have access to a screener, but when is this going to be available for other people, right? Yeah. Like I certainly take joy out of reading and watching movies and and you know all that stuff. But really, my kind of goal as a critic is 
how can I save my audience time? How do I save them from terrible experiences? How do I highlight experiences that they might not have like been aware of, you know, uh, the indie films that really need that extra push. And so seeing these films and being like, okay, I'm going to wait for months and months to talk about this and just being like excited, like Minari is a perfect example of something I was like, mm -hmm. I want everyone in the world to see this. When is it coming out? Oh, it's finally out, but it's months after I saw it. Um, so yeah, but I'm always happy to talk about streaming stuff. I think it's part of the cultural zeitgeist. Like what are we, if not a part of that conversation? Yeah, I, I hope that the online, that now that they've shown that they have the infrastructure to do this, which realistically means they've had it for a while, I hope that it doesn't go away, mm -hmm. as is the case for like a lot of things now that they clearly have been able to accommodate people being able to stay home all along, I hope doesn't go away. So I hope that it's like, you know, for not that in general. Uh, I know that there will probably be some pushback on that from people. Uh, I just want to clarify from earlier, by the way, when I go to a movie theater again, I will be wearing two masks. I wear two masks everywhere. I will be wearing my, my brother will wear this. I still wear gloves. Everyone else stopped wearing gloves. I still wear the blue gloves when I go anywhere. If you come up to me not wearing a mask, that's the face that's getting there you broken, go. Yeah. is the person not wearing the mask. That's just to be clear, because I don't want to get letters when this eventually airs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope that they, for press and for people in general, uh, get this up. Because while I want to go to in-person screenings again, because I think that that has a real effect. Right. And that you like see how it actually plays. And you can see, I don't know how, what everyone else's experience is. is I'm here in Boston, mid-market. So the screenings for press occasionally have... Uh, other, you know, the the regular audience in as well when they try to pack it in and do a radio screening or whatnot. But uh, you you can actually see what this works like with an audience, which can help sometimes if you want to get a read of how it's going to react to people. But I have observed that the number of local press people, local to me, and uh, I'm part of the Boston Online Film Critics Association, for example, some of our local critics who do not, because they're in the far-flung Western Mass areas outside of Boston, who can't take the two-hour train ride into town for every screening, right. are now this year able to see a lot more of the contenders yeah. that uh, they would not be able to otherwise, because they're getting digital screeners are going out to everyone in theory, in right. theory. And uh, that, so that's been better. I hope that doesn't go away in much the same way that I hope that all of this lovely quote unquote Zoom infrastructure that's popped up that has been something that people that I know who have difficulty leaving their homes in general, uh, you know, people who uh, have difficulty walking, can't walk, period, right. would have loved to have had this for the last six, seven years to be able to work off site. I hope this doesn't go away just because abled people don't need it anymore to right. quote unquote to telecommute. I also hope that this side of this industry doesn't just disappear as well, because this is actually a minor benefit of this otherwise completely hellish period that we've been in. In my opinion, didn't mean to get off on a rant. Sorry. No, no, it's fine. I think there's a lot of a lot of what this past year has been isn't intrinsically did anything new, but it's accelerated a whole lot of stuff. The whole migration to working from home, the online streaming services having you know first run films running uh, dropping day and date. I think those you know they were all things that were writings on the wall, but we were talking about them to coming up five years from now, not next week. And now we're having that kind of thing occur, and just wondering what that will happen because I know like here in San Francisco, along with Dana, we have many member critics of our local association that really are not fond of of streaming services with the notion that real movies don't do streaming um <laughs> and now it's uh, now that it's a thing because i've always found it i loathe it intrinsically when a, when a studio drops oscar bait you know like in one theater or two theaters in the country two days before the end of the year just so that they can get in under the wire you know critics are horribly biased very often amongst the groups about for recency bias especially and so they, we, they get all the cool care packages and the swag and the, by the way, here it is that you just saw five minutes ago, please now vote, um, is, you know, I wish it was you know, more of an even playing field. So if people are streaming, then that's fine. If you're going to release something, just release it to the masses. Because I hate doing a review or talking about something that's really going to get nominated for awards that most of our readers have never seen 
or heard of. And we're sitting here telling them that it's the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, and yeah, I think that's just one thing I'd like to see more of is if we're talking about shows that they've had a chance to see them. They're not only opening in New York and LA and that, that's it. Uh, sorry, that's my rant about, you know, I like streaming films and this entire year has given us a lot more opportunities to find, uh, to Dana's point, off the beaten path stuff. Uh, and in Alan's, uh, in, uh, your entire site is really a, a great yeah. dedication to finding stuff that people would not otherwise have come across. Yeah, honestly, this is, uh, yeah, honestly, this has been um, kind of a, a golden age for independent films. Uh, we, we have not, we have never been busier at Film Thread since the, the pandemic. We, we've been reviewing on average about six movies a day uh, yeah. in, in wow. films. Uh, it's it's just out there and people are making movies they're making movies now they're mm -hmm. finding ways to <laughs> to uh, make their film without much notice and uh you know people have stories to tell and you know and with the big movies stepping aside for an entire year it's just been a, a great time for any independent filmmaker to get their work out there and and, and get and have a a greater chance of being seen you know yeah. and that's why we exist basically yeah. you know, both independent films and foreign and foreign yeah. content as well because with so much of, of the production pipeline having dried up last year you, we saw a lot of especially amazon hulu and netflix diving into their um you know what do we have licenses for from h yeah i had no idea there was an hbo europe and hbo asia and hbo this and now i'm finding series and films from there that are that are fabulous and now they they're making they're trickling across into the domestic market um and hoping to get more yeah i'm getting recommended a lot of korean soap operas <laughs> see it's when you end up having enough content that you can have an entire dedicated section on the site just to you know <laughs> all right the best k-pop soundtracks coming out this week uh, and if it weren't for the pandemic i never would have found emily in paris so uh, i think I, you mean golden globe nominee emily yes in paris. Golden globe please refer to it correctly by its appropriate <laughs> laurels and mle in Philly. yeah i got so hooked on that it was a my, my my favorite pandemic binge find was dark German uh, sci-fi. Has anybody seen it on Netflix? I've, on Netflix, still yeah. don't understand it. Still. Oh my gosh! No, 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 no! But it it is so crazy and so. Um, I ended up binging seasons seasons one and two to catch up to my friends who were talking about three for uh, working their way through three for the podcast. But it's funny because they had such a distinct pattern for the show. And my favorite part was like five minutes before the end of the episode, the obligatory pop song, usually in a, almost always in English, <laughs> like clockwork. But they've got a new show on uh, something of Europa. It's like a dystopian future thing. Yeah. It's also supposed to be good. So. I think the only main thing that's bugging me with a lot of series right now is the CW syndrome, where all of the, all of the, stars on the show are like 20 somethings uh mm -hmm. sort of a business it's like no it might as well be logan's run it'll be you know every show on cw <laughs> could be logan's run cast um because there's just nobody over a certain age and it's really bizarre because it didn't used to be this way and then somewhere around like oh five oh six it just the ages dropped off the, off the cliff wow. i used to think that cw stands for cute white people <laughs> oh man, you could absolutely pitch someone, you or someone should absolutely pitch Logan's Run as a CW series. Well, it'd be boring because no one ever hits 30 years old to die. They're just, oh, yeah, they're exactly. always just cast off the series. Yeah. What was that? Oh shoot. What was the Andrew Nickel? Was it, was it in time? Was the end of Nickel movie from like a decade ago? with uh, Timberlake and uh, Timberlake Amanda. Like, and, uh, oh yes, where the, they had the, the clocks. Right, they only the, had so much time. time. No, no, right. one, no one ages past like 25. Yeah, like, but, like but you could earn, you could trade off your your payment was in time and you would pay yeah, in yeah. time and everything. But, yeah, but like everyone is physically only about twenty five years old, so there was a like an in universe excuse to only cast <laughs> models for every single uh, role in the movie. Oh not, my god, not that bad of a movie actually. Pretty there good. was a, the sci fi like I love me some Katie Sackhoff, but there was the series that she was on. It got uh, a second like, season. Is it? It got a second season. Yes, I just I was bruising cruising through Netflix. It's terrible. 
because there was dialogue in season one where they actually say, why is everyone on this ship so young? And someone else goes, that's because after a certain age, they have no dedication to purpose or anything like that. <laughs> and it was something like that. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? And I'm like, what? I want to know what writer in the, in the writer's room said, I, I have an answer for this. <laughs> I thought the actors on that made the CW ones look like Royal Shakespeare Company. I, I was, yeah, it, it goes along the lines of when you think that, wow, I've seen some uh, Star Trek fan films that look a good deal better than this. But, you know, it, by the time the season one was over, I was getting into it more. But that, those first few episodes, especially, were like, just no. But then you have other sci fi and, and genre things this past year. Devs um, was really pretty amazing writing, even though it's a little bit that. oddball. But the dev, uh, again, just some great writing running around these days. Dana, what's the favorite thing you've seen of late, either film or series? Uh, I mean, I think, as I mentioned, Minari is one of my favorite films of last year. I think it's a beautiful film. Um, I'm trying to think of all the series. I, that's the other problem with the last year, because we're still in March of 2020, uh, and we are recording this in March of 2021, but my brain is still stuck in, you know, 365 <laughs> days ago. So I'm like, I know I've watched so many things this past year, but I just can't remember them. Right. Which is, you know... Partially the maybe quality of some of them and partially uh, the uh, WandaVision. WandaVision is like the number Ooh. one thing I'm watching right now. You know, I think we all are. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, re it's really good. I keep feeling like, should I admit that this, that I really like this as much as I do? Because it's like the most like normie thing that there is, but it's also like really good. <laughs> it's like, yeah, the Disney sitcom about the Avengers is actually really good. My only thing is I have to explain everything to my, my wife. Again, my kid. Like I had to explain why who Evan Peters was and why he's so important. <laughs> what I what I like about that is like I found myself like doing all like because I'm I'm getting paid to do this now. Right. I I have a um part uh, part thing with a uh, film theory, you know where and it's also on my own thing about um uh Matthew Patrick's uh, outfit on uh, YouTube, which uh, you know check us out. Good stuff. And uh, on uh, my own thing on the big picture of, uh, you know, so hey, comic book lore, what, here's a thing that happened. This is why people think that this is a big deal. And uh, like my mother also watches this show and, uh, you know, will ask me when I see her, you know, like, why are people making a big deal about this? About like, who's, I understand he's like, doesn't look like the guy from the other movie. What is this? And what I'm realizing is this is only important if you know beforehand it's supposed to be important. <laughs> Right. Otherwise, it's like it's it's two totally different mysteries because there's like the meta thing that the fans are obsessed with, which ultimately will not matter, never mattered, and will, I mean, because no, they're not going to do like a meta X-Men Deadpool joke thing as the plot of what they're treating like a fairly semi-serious dramatic series, mm. sort of, in the meta, in its own meta sense. But they weren't going to say, oh, no, there's another universe that's in the Fox world and with X-Men and Hugh Jackman. is No, they weren't going to do that. But, like, it's a thing for the internet to play with all week and keep them in the news cycle right. for a while. I mean, but they kind of did do that. Like, that's exactly what they did. They didn't explicitly go into it, but they are acknowledging, you know, I, I feel like they, they didn't have to use Evan Peters. They could have used somebody else. And so I, I do yeah, think yeah. they're like... Here you go, nerds. <laughs> and I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Give me more of this. Right, right in my veins. Like, I feel like a lesser thing would have actually made something of it or like would have had like a, a like made a, like put more of it. Of, of a, but the season's not over yet. We don't know where it's going. This is true. That, that, this, this is, this is true. Yet. I'm glad Dana brought up w WandaVision though, because if you remember back the, those halcyon days of six, seven weeks ago when the first episodes were dropping and people were complaining about what is this i don't like it, it just, it's like oh my gosh they take a big swing to do something different from your standard marvel movie and everybody you know the haters the first few episodes are all out with their knives out until we get to episode four and they start to explain i think it's brilliant i i, I had not seen jack schaefer's work before i will search her out because I think she's amazing. And what she's done, and there's a quote in the last episode um, that Vision tells Wanda in the flashback, memory, whatever, that uh, grief is love that perseveres. Yeah, That is a beautiful quote, especially for where we are as a world, you know, 
hopefully coming out of this pandemic. But man, and Elizabeth Olsen, I always knew she was good, but that she better get an Emmy nod because yeah. she's nailing everything. And Katherine Hahn's always wonderful. I think I'm the odd person out a little bit. Now, granted, I am getting more in to WandaVision as the season goes on, but those first couple episodes were just killing me because I'm still kind of pissed off at David Lynch after the last season of Twin Peaks because he was being clever just to be clever. And here, part of those first couple episodes, it's kind of like, you're being, you're doing this just to try and be cute, not for a point, um, uh, to me anyway, specifically. And I was also kind of wondering exactly how many of some of their key demographic have ever seen any of those shows. Exactly how much Mary Tyler Moore has the you know standard you know teen, uh, teenager at this point really watched. Um, and, and I'm finding out that some people have and some people it did indeed make interested to go back and check out some of those shows where they really now that much like it, but it's, you know, but granted, yes, by about episode four, it's like, okay, fine, fine, maybe. And now progressively each later episode, I'm like, all right, fine. It's, it's good. Did anyone else uh, get the screen? Cause I, I got the, the, the press screeners. That was one of the, the things that Disney plus actually sent me before I, <laughs> Yeah. Like reach out to specifically ask them because they sent the they sent the first three three yeah as their as their press package yeah right? which was interesting to me that they sent the first three and then dropped the first so they gave people the first two black and white ones right and then that one yeah. that was my original thing was I I really didn't think that uh, no actually we can bring up this in a second is the the, the some people prefer. Um, season drops at this point and so they can binge and other people for the weekly so you can kind of like talk with everyone for the weeks through um, then, then there's the hybrid that I kind of wonder early on if it would have done a little bit different for the kickoff for WandaVision if they had dropped those first three as one block <clears throat> giving them a little bit more to get into you know hook onto in that first because I find myself when I was watching those first three like I said I didn't really like the first two that much but by the end of the third one i'm like okay now we're now we're getting somewhere and i was finally wanting more and i was thinking that they might have wanted to do that out, outset but now they're doing fine anyway they don't need they don't need jack they're doing totally fine with their numbers so i'm just enjoying it from from a creative standpoint yeah because, uh, i mean i grew up reading comic books so i'm used right. to this serialization but I, I love the slow burn and and that's what that's what those first three episodes were it's a slow burn to something greater and you you know, unfortunately, they don't they don't tell you about the slow burn. They just present it to you, and and okay. unless you know it's yeah. coming, unless you know that something grander is coming, you, your perspective on those first three episodes, cold, is completely different. Yeah, true, true. The you know thinking about slow burn. I mean that that's been been a phrase for a while, and I think some some shows, and I'll give it to Wonder Vision as as being one of those that does it well. There's others like. House of Cards, people go, oh, slow burn. No, you misspelled the word boring. Uh, <laughs> where it's like when you have an hour of stuff and really five minutes of story advancement happen, that's just dull as bricks. But again, WandaVision is, yeah, sure, it, it's slow, but it's doing it with a purpose and with a cadence and, and setting it up. So, I mean, I'll give, they're doing it you know, far more, I'd say, the right way, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, it's this idea that, um, you know, gimmicks in films, tropes in films, it's not that they're bad ideas, it's just they're not executed well. Yeah. And and the whole key of the slow burn is how do you execute it? How do you yeah. manage what audiences see so that you're not losing them, but you want to get your creative idea across here? And right. I think, totally. You know, I think WandaVision, I, I think for Marvel fans, you know, they were willing to put up with the slow burn. Oh, yeah, totally. But for someone cold like like my family, uh, completely different story. Dana. Yeah, I want to touch on a couple of points y'all brought up. So uh, I I am someone who probably is the youngest here. Um, and and to the the point of, oh, are people familiar with this? Well, I, I'm a generation that had Nick at night, right? And that is like all you had. And so there's this whole group of people who are very familiar with the, the shows that they're paying homage to because that's just what was on TV. You know, you got to get that syndication money. And so I do think it was a very smart move and I have to give them credit for just the subtle nuances, like the difference between a Malcolm in the middle and a modern family 
it's, it, you know, from afar, it's like, oh, it's not that different. Oh, it really is different. And they captured it so well. Um, to Bob's point about, oh, getting the first three, I got the first three and my two podcast co-hosts, you know, watched them when they dropped, like they didn't have the screeners. And it was a very different experience for the two of us. And I was just like, I just want to tell you about episode three, like stick with, and they loved the first two. So it wasn't, they were hooked. They are Marvel fans. They are in, but I was just like, I needed the third episode right. for me to get invested. But uh, I, so I, I saw the sort of reactions across the board. I went, no, no, I'm, I'm going to wait. I'm in. Um, and then Alan, what you said earlier about being a Kong fan, my, my co-host Matt pointed out, he's like, yeah, it, it's about 25 minutes an episode. You know, some are a little longer, some are shorter. That's about how long it takes you to read an issue of a comic book. Right. And so they have actually really, truly structured it in a really brilliant way where it is mirroring the, you know, source material that they are drawing from. They've done such a good job of that. They're just balancing so many things. And then with comic books, you know, you probably have to wait usually what, two weeks, sometimes a month, depending on when the next issue is coming. This is like, oh, it's coming next week. I know exactly when it's gonna come out. It's gonna be next week. I, I just, I like that they have found a way to marry all of these things together in one very popular uh, accessible show. Yeah, that cliffhanger is so important for this series. The credits yeah. are the greatest villain of WandaVision. <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean, you know, I haven't seen cliffhangers like this since Lost. Uh, you know, you're just kind of glued and now you got to wait that week. And you're just frustrated because you just want to know what's going to happen. I want to know what the... Oh, I'm sorry, Tom, I think I cut you off. Oh, I love that uh, episode eight paid off something from episode two. And the commercial from, I think, episode six or seven. Um, <laughs> again, there's nothing wasted. Everything has a purpose. And that's, I think, a difference of how Marvel, Feige's, Feige's MCU approaches storytelling versus DC's whoever's in charge this week. Throw, throw paint at the wall, see what sticks. I want to know which, uh, I want to know what being Kevin Feige sold something very valuable to. And I want to know like when he cashes it in, because at this point, something else is going on. I mean, the answer is probably Mephisto, right? Like yeah, we all Trump. think it's Mephisto, oh, right, yes. right, right, right? Feige is actually Mephisto. That would actually explain a whole lot throughout all of this. Yeah, I'm waiting for Mephisto to show up in the next Spider-Man movie. Well, yes. the, no, I, I, because it is at this point, like there's luck and there's having your entire schedule thrown out of whack by a global pandemic and somehow the show, the project that ends up being the one that you're basically forced to launch with, even though you were trying to launch with two or three other things, is the project that is a gigantic nine episode television metaphor for being locked inside your feelings with television nostalgia and how to cope with that. Preach. <laughs> like there's luck and there's who are you and why are you using this power to produce for Disney? Yeah. That's no, really it's... something. I, mean, I, was, I think that power is producing for good. Like I, I am grateful to everything he has been doing. So. Yeah. Wait, what's no, interesting is is, uh, is Black Star Widow. Is also climate change. Yeah, what's interesting is Black Widow. That was the perfect movie to push off for a while, you mm. know, to be that next movie and and to say, all right, we can we can hold off on this one and then restart, you know, the MCU after this one comes out. Yeah, yeah. sadly. <laughs> Actually, your analog of uh, uh, was the structure that the, the length of length of the episode, Dana, you mentioned, uh, is basically the same as writing a, reading a comic and then the experience of comic, and then thinking about the commercials. It's kind of like the X ray visions, X ray vision goggles ads in the mm -hmm. comics that we all saw and got. Well, this might be cool, and you know, and flip through. So it kind of has that vibe, even though yes, in its, in its case, it does add to the story as well, but it does kind of again recreate that feeling of you know, here's this bite-sized entertainment and now you're hooked for what's next or there's things that happen in it that you want to know more and then you go suddenly searching for random character names that's like, this is a big person, what should I know about this person? And then go off you go and go running for it. Is anybody besides me kind of excited for the Snyder Cut? I'm, uh, I'm interested. I could not, I could not care less. I, I yeah, barely I've... watched the first one. I'm... And no judgment to people who are excited for it. I just, it's not, it's not for me. I'm, I'm, I would love for, I'm, I'm in two minds. So on the one hand, 
you know, I would love for the DC to have a better opportunity to really shine in, in a good positive way and would love for that. And, and the other way, I really don't want the haters to be right mm. uh, because then they'll just be insufferable uh, more so than they are now. But, you know, it's always, I mean, in my mind, Warner Brothers has continuously been hamstringing itself by second guessing itself. They've rarely let their folks go off and, and really create unless it's something that they thought they didn't care about. And you suddenly end up with things like Joker or uh, uh, they end up with The Flash. It's like, oh, or uh, Shazam. Shazam. Shazam's not going to do shit. So just whatever, go do your thing and push it out the door. And it ends up being a charming little film um, as opposed to when it's like Suicide Squad that first time around and they're like, oh Ooh. shit, Daredevil just did really well. Let's go back and make it edgier and darker and and again, second guess what they were trying to do. And I would love to kind of know if, if Snyder Cut really is Snyder Cut Okay, did he really have something something going there that's going to be cool? It'd be nice if it was, but my hopes are not high. No, it, no it, one. It's got to be better than theatrical release because. But I think I, I think I Snyder was, Cut. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say I think Snyder Cut brings up a really interesting dichotomy that has been going on online, especially for the longest time. But there are certain you know entities that you are, if you have an opinion on it you are wrong right it's like right. it doesn't matter what the opinion is but you're wrong um i you know uh, uh dc movies star wars just like the, the, the toxic fandoms yeah. um that exist around certain properties and marvel you know and just anything popular right and as a critic you know as, as an individual i'm like i have personal feelings about these things i you know that some i like some i don't some i you know love some i hate um but as a critic i feel like i especially now have to be super careful about what i say because i don't want to get like screamed at for no reason um and and i feel like i'm in a no win scenario more often than not these days i don't know if anyone else is feeling the same I, you know it's mostly applicable again to these big uh, huge you know blockbuster properties but it's it's becoming more and more frustrating to be like i don't feel safe talking about certain things right i you know i've kind of come around i, I wouldn't say come around but i've if there's like a, a fifth position, like a, not even a middle ground, like if there's a, I, I feel like you need like a, like a, like the San Francisco 12 lane highway on the opinions vis-a-vis -vis like the Snyder cut at this point, because it's like, I am not a fan of the Justice League movie. I didn't like the Batman v Superman. Right. I think Zack Snyder turned out to be really wrong for all of this material. And I, but I like Zack Snyder. He seems like an okay guy. I like most of his movies that aren't this. The fan base that has grown up around this is completely toxic. They they hate me, so I can say that they already hate me. I'm I'm the only overweight bearded white male they don't like, <laughs> and it is just horrible. And they're just an awful awful fan base. And I don't like the movie. I don't expect the Snyder Cut to be good. I expect it to be bad in a different way. But all of the stuff that has come out since the production of this with Ray Fisher, who seems like he's got some really legitimate stuff to be upset about. It sounds like some actual that went down there that was tied into what also happened with Zack Snyder. It sounds like a lot of, it sounds like definitely Joss Whedon and possibly also Jeff Johns have some actual answer for on that movie in terms of how they treated their cast, how things that went on behind the scenes and things that went down with the people running that studio. So I want to see what this, I'm sure the movie is still not good because I, it seems like it was made of not good parts. I'm probably not going to enjoy it but if that coming out and getting some kind of big thing is a component of showing up the people that tossed it out for the wrong reasons and then justified the, the behavior that they had toward these individuals on the movie based on the fact that the other stuff wasn't good, okay, I'm willing to see that roll out because if those guys can get a certain amount of justice for themselves, because it really feels like this young guy, uh, Ray Fisher, and a few other people on this movie who had everything to lose actually stood up to very powerful people behind the scenes, which takes real balls in right. the position that they were in, forgive my colorful language, and got really screwed. 
And if this coming out and maybe doing something is like a component part of them not blowing up their whole career in order to do what was right, okay, I can get behind that, even if the movie is still not fantastic. Uh, so I can get behind it in that respect. And I want to see in any context, even again, if the movie is not something I like, the idea that, uh, you know, Zack Snyder can get this movie that it looks like he was pushed out of when in a vulnerable position. If he can get that out, okay, I can get behind that as well, even if I don't like the finished product. I really hope still that once this is all said and done, that this is part of a general moving on overall from that whole edge of all of this. Now that they've managed to do, okay, this didn't work this was finished now we've we've tried it both ways it still didn't work both ways it sounds like they might have problems on aquaman 2 and be recasting a bunch of people it sounds like they're gonna have to do something about the next wonder woman whenever they do it because that didn't work twice and uh so who knows they're gonna have to get a new superman uh so i hope that this is if if this is part of the all of this coming down and then moving on. I hope that you know, a little bit of this is some of the people that got screwed on it getting a little bit of justice is my ramble on that. I don't expect it to be good. Maybe it'll be interesting. And I support Ray Fisher is my feeling on that. Which is ironic for a movie called Justice League. Um, mm -hmm. Two things. Uh, uh, one, I thought it was uh, startling that when Charisma Carpenter finally broke silence, she hashtagged, I stand with Ray Fisher. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other Buffy people came out in support of, of her and him. And then also going back to Dana's comment about toxic fandom, had an interesting exchange with one of my film students. I, I mentioned in passing, so I thought that I liked episode eight of Star Wars and the student's like, really? And I just pointed at him and said, and that's why you got the episode nine you did. <laughs> because I have a feeling that after the controversy of episode eight and people reacting, you know, the, the toxic fans not liking what Ryan Johnson did, that Disney corporate ordered JJ land the plane and catch all the balls in the air. So we got a very tepid, no risks taking, you know, you know mo moderately satisfying conclusion to the Skywalker saga, when we could have had something really amazing. Which but has now happened the, twice. Yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. an old, so, you know, I'm, and even I'm too young to sort of remember it, but I remember <laughs> Star Wars fans older than me telling me as a young kid, well, younger kid, <laughs> at like, you know, 12 years old or so, it's like, you know, it was like a meme back then was say, like, you know, you only like Return of the Jedi because you're like a kid. And, you know, that movie had like teddy bears beating the Empire. And they did it because people complained that the that Empire was too dark. So they had to change it. And when you grow up, you'll know better. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like, I guess the lesson is those guys suck in every era. <laughs> well it's true well think about you know all the you know you know when phantom menace happened and then all the howling around you know jar jar and how kind of lame that was but now you get to seven eight nine and people are like man this doesn't you know god if only george could come back i'm like you remember what george is doing? <laughs> are you serious george, and it's if, if I were George Lucas, I would like photograph myself smoking the biggest cigars <laughs> and, and just like sitting on a lawn chair in Malibu every day. He's smoking the million dollar bills. That's yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what, what are we going to do though? Because like the, like they, I mean, they've already, they've already won though, is, yeah. is the thing. Like the, it, like Lucas had to wait like decades and then decades again for people to say, George, we're sorry. And, you know, like uh, Kathleen Kennedy and everyone had to wait like a year for the uh, the Mandalorian to come out. Yeah, You know, they had to, they, they basically just had to sit back and say, oh gosh, no, people thought that this one was only okay. Whatever are we gonna do? Oh yeah. gee, if only there was a Muppet to help. 
<laughs> and you know, Buddha will lead them. You know, it actually goes back to Dana's comment earlier about it gives us all of us a bit of a challenge as to, you know, who are we writing to a little bit, right? Because we have such a divergent audience now. We have people from different eras, different generations, different tastes and different preferences. So trying to distill that down and translate the relative merits of a film is going to be a little, you know, there are some things that are just, you know, generalized, but other aspects about, hey, whether I think little Timmy versus little Susie will like a given film is there's so many, param there's more, there feels like there's more parameters now than there used to be to kind of say that, hey, if you like sci-fi, you'll like this. Now it's more like, all right, if you like Phantom Menace, you'll like this. But if you like, you know, Force Awakens, you'll like this. Um, it's not, it's, no. Go ahead. It's go not ahead. even about little Timmy and little Jill. It's about the internet troll and, and yeah, fear true. of what, what the mob is going to say about your film and whether you're going to offend, which, which of the loudest voice are you going to offend and which one has the most influence when it comes to, you know, who gets the attention when, yeah. when it all comes down. Uh, and that's the sad thing about it is, you know, now you're, rather than telling your story, you're worried about the worst segment of the loudest voice. Right. And, uh, and it's just, sure. you know, like you, like you said, Thomas, that, that ruined episode nine. Because uh, I, I loved where they ended episode eight. And, and it, it was almost as if that didn't happen. You know, that they just started off as, well, things weren't as that, that bad, really. And, and they had such great creative potential with that episode nine. And they just, they just caved. And, uh, and that's what we got. And they should have, they shouldn't have listened. They, they shouldn't have listened is the thing, you know, they, they should have done what, uh, and I mean, like they, I think they've, they're starting to grasp this now, now that they've made uh, other things, but like you look at the star Wars strategy, which was basically to capitulate, uh, you know, more or less, and I'm not like shitting on them. I understand like it's, yeah. they probably had like logic dictating what they were doing. But then you look at the way that uh, the the Marvel guys within the same company run the same kind of machine and their approach to it pretty much since they severed themselves from Ike Perlmutter and Marvel Publishing has been, wait a minute, aren't we pretty much going to make a billion dollars just by turning on the switch that plays the Marvel Films logo at the beginning <laughs> and therefore we can kind of do whatever we want uh, because this is what we do and they experiment a little bit like they like they don't ex i'm not saying they're not making like david lynch's movies you know like right. lars von trier is not going to come in you know i'm not even going to say that because this went every time i say they're not going to do that they do that <laughs> so you know whatever like taika watiti made a thor movie fine okay the, he's making another one yeah. The director of he's Nomad also making a Star Wars movie. Like. Yeah, right. the, dire the director of Nomadland is literally already shot the next uh, big Marvel movie. It's like sitting in the can waiting to come out so they can put the from the Academy Award winning director of label on the Eternals. So, and you know, it's not going to be based on the actors' real lives this time. <laughs> uh, you so didn't know Angelina Nomad Jolie is actually a space Eternal. alien, like, that is the only explanation for. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was method. It was all yeah. method. <laughs> they, they don't get it in, but like they they don't pay attention to to that. They could have just not listened to those guys. Well, that's the thing about episode eight is they didn't pay attention. Uh, right. They let Ryan Johnson have complete and absolute control, and then you know half the universe loved it and half the universe hated, it, and they decided to go with you know the the more angrier side to make nine. Yeah, I, I think. I think my comment, though, has more to do with like, you know, we're discussing the merits of the actual films. There's the the filmmakers that they deal with the brunt of that. But then we are sort of this secondary. Uh, we're in that orbit. Right. And then that's where it gets very awkward for me, at least, where I'm just like, I don't I, I literally if you've noticed, I have not weighed in on episode eight, nor will I publicly ever <laughs> again, because I just I don't want to I don't want to deal with it. Right. And maybe. Part of that is, um, you know, I'm the only woman here. Um, I am, you know, I, I, there's a, certainly a, like a toxic factor that gets amplified by that part online. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about it in this panel previously when, you know, Alex and, and Mab have been here. It's just, you know, it comes with the extra territory. Several of us are people of color. That's a separate, you know, there's a whole bag of a can of worms that comes with that. But, um, you know, the internet is great and terrible in that it amplifies voices of all sorts. But, uh, 
yeah, like there are just certain topics that I, as a critic, feel like I just don't want to go near anymore because right. I don't want to deal with it. I, I will say in, in answer to Bill's same point, well, same question, that the the be, the the best thing recently that that I've uh, of well I'd say best like among many negative things about this business has been finding out as I've gotten a little bit older that I'm no longer writing to my own audience to to an audience of me which is a bit free because for a long time like I was kind of it was like a conversation with just copies of myself which like at the at first you know felt you know it's like well, okay yeah it's just talking to my buddies and now it's like you know I'm finding like uh, you know when especially when freelancing for sites that are other than myself you know the feedback is you know you keep it you know dial learn to explain references and things like that sure. for people who are not uh, 100% versed in this and it's like oh this is much more interesting you know because there's a whole other set of perspectives who are following the same things and watching, viewing the same things, rediscovering, discovering the same things who are, you know, 20 years older, 15 years, 20 years younger, 15 years younger, in some cases older that, than I am, that say, or from completely different backgrounds, from completely different uh, parts of the world, parts of the, well, parts of the world, really, it's only one world, but you, you get the idea. And it's, uh, it's much more interesting and it's, uh, you know, it's, it was getting so dull you know, just communicating with people exactly like myself about all of this stuff, because there's only so many times I can have like the Kevin Smith conversations right. about the Death Star workers or whatnot. It's like I I already know what I think about stuff. I already I already know what I like, and uh, so there's there's that going on. Yeah, one thing that uh, you know I, I I felt the same way um, about being a film critic and I think the approach I've taken and I don't know that it's 100% work but it, to me if I don't like a movie I've got to be very clear as to why I don't like the movie and not just say oh I just hated it, it was redacted it, you know it's it was, you know and so so like when Wonder Woman uh, WW84 came out um, you know I didn't like it and, and I base and and, I, and at one point I was questioning well is it because you're a man and and was like no because Wonder Woman eighty four felt like a television episode of the original Wonder Woman movie, and that's not why we go to movies. And and I just had to explain you know this is why the um, even the odd numbered Star Trek episodes never worked because they tried to be two hour television episodes, and that's what Wonder Woman eighty four felt like. It was just it was had nothing to do with the bigger world of the Justice League. It just felt like an episode of Wonder Woman, you know, and 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 I felt like that explaining it that way kind of got me off the hook of saying, well, yeah, at least he thought about it and he had a reason to to not like something. Right. I, mean, I did the same when talking about like Nomadland. Like I personally hated Nomadland with the fierce passion of a thousand suns, but that's just because of me. That's my personal reaction to it. I will absolutely watching it and doing a review. I had to stick with, you know what? This is a pretty good film because this, this, and this, and this, but I'll do a, I do a side note going for me, it didn't resonate because of some particular points of it. Um, and that, that working on just, I mean, you know, personal preference, because that's kind of like such a hugely subjective because everyone likes so many things for so many different reasons. But I, usually I can at least appreciate, you know, the merits of a piece because of, you know, because of craft, performances, acting, that sort of stuff. I, that one just didn't, right? Same sort of reason that I, I, the other one that I hated last year was uh, Borat sequel. Um, <laughs> again, I just hate Borat. That character <laughs> just is like chalk, uh, nails on a chalkboard to me. But again, I totally see why so many people really do, you know, they enjoy it, they resonate with it and why it's so timely and, and fascinating. And it's great watching some people getting raked over the coals is great. But as a movie, it's like, I would never pay to see that. Ever. Yeah, I didn't like Soul. And, yeah. um, and, and I'll admit, I, I didn't like it for very petty reasons. Yeah. Um, but I, I have to own it, you know, and that's. Yeah. But that's the whole thing. You just kind of say, it's like, look, I didn't like a thing because of just me that and and tell people like you know what you guys go check it out you probably you know you you may well love this piece um but just you know letting people know it's just not saying something sucks just because it's the vogue thing to do and that's what thing that's one thing took a while is is 
for me getting used to saying that either I like something or didn't like something with the main popular vibe is, you know, the opposite reason to kind of going, no, this, this is not cool for me. Um, Cause I, I, and it was also n nervous early on with reps. It's like, oh, I, I go get to see the press screenings. I don't want to lambast the poor reps <laughs> movies, but I've never met a rep that really hung, you know, they can tell the difference between just a negative view and a slash piece. Mm -hmm. that you're just shredding it for sport and so it's like and they're always cool it's like they're only going to be bent if you just went after it with pitchforks for fun yeah i'll admit i i put off watching one night in miami for a very long time and yeah. part of it was i was afraid i wasn't going to like it yeah and um thank god i loved it <laughs> and, uh, yeah. but but there's that fear is like yeah. okay if i don't like it what what do i have to say about it and uh you know who who am i going to trigger who am i going to piss off yeah and what uh Oh, oh, go ahead. Uh, one of the things I try to be very conscious of with my film appreciation students, especially since it's a general studies class, is explaining that there are objective criteria to evaluate a film. Is it well shot? Is it yeah. you know, well directed? Good at acting, great sound design, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also a lot of personal opinion. Does it work for you? And when there's a film I don't like, I tell them exactly what I'm reacting to. I told them, we talked about Dunkirk briefly in class today. I told them I don't buy the time scheme. It seems very writery and confusing to most audiences. And I don't like the wall to wall sound because silence is also a part of sound, sound design and the sound is bombastic throughout. But what do I know? It won the two sound Academy <laughs> Award. But those are my personal preferences. Yeah. And I think that's important for them to know. And my advice to them when we start talking about crit film criticism to prepare them to write their final papers is to, I, I recommend find a film critic whose aesthetic values align with yours because otherwise film reviews are useless. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, I think we're hitting towards the end of our time in all of this stuff. It's been, you know, it's funny, six months go by and here we are chatting once again. I find I, I miss everyone like greatly. I cannot wait to Indeed. finally have physical events. Can we, hang, we can hang around and have drinks again and everything. One day, one day it will one happen. Day. High five and hug and everything. <laughs> totally do. We can go back, to, uh, we can finally all hang out in New York for New York Comic Con and San Diego on our side of the country and, and it'll be great one day. Is that uh, not to be drinking? Drinking, all the drinking. Yeah. Hey, Thomas, you were in California a year ago, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. 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 Like so Thomas it. just went over to the other to the other coast. And so now we're we're a, a collective of cross-country folks. Um, so before we wrap up for the time, thank you all for joining us for uh, WonderCon at home. And let's say again, where can people find you guys online? Bob. I'm at uh, moviebobcentral.com, the movie bob YouTube channel, and uh, freelancing with uh, film theory. Cool. Tom. Blurred PhD on Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. Alan. Uh, filmthreat.com and at filmthreat on everything. Dana. Find me at the DHK, T H E D H K, uh, all over the internet and also on the We're Watching What podcast. Awesome. What is We're Watching What? I just keep. But you have to say it with the, with the accent because sometimes it's, oh, we're watching what? And sometimes it's, we're watching what? <laughs> okay what episode. we're watching <laughs> i'm totally gonna check that out and i'm bill waters you can find me on just about everywhere at bill rw and the number three and on nerdbot so everybody that's it for us and we'll see you in a couple months on virtual san diego see you guys thanks y'all bye bye <laughs>